to the balcony. In the meantime, we'll get this party started. My name is Andrea Rosen. I'm the curator here at the Fleming Museum. And I am Sarah Mel, the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the UVM Women's Center. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so obviously from our joint introduction, this program is really a joint effort um, as reflected by the many people here tonight. So that's really exciting. You'll hear more about our partners. Um, so I want to start uh, by introducing um, our great act tonight and then we'll talk about uh, some of those thank yous. Um, we're delighted to present Donna Kaz, aka Afra Ben, in her talk, Push Slash Pushback, Nine Steps to Make a Difference with Art and Activism. The activist group Guerrilla Girls came onto the scene in New York City in 1985 as a group of women artists operating incognito, their identities disguised by guerrilla costumes with the mission of exposing gender and racial bias within the art world. The group has gone through a number of iterations since that time, most notably in 2000, splitting into three separate groups. In 2001, Donna formed one of those groups, Guerrilla Girls on Tour a touring theater company focused on promoting gender parity in the arts, along with other issues affecting women artists and artists of color. Donna Kaz is a playwright, performer, and author of the 2016 publication Unmasked, Memoirs of a Guerrilla Girl on Tour, excerpts of which she will share with us tonight, and I believe you can buy a copy out front. It's true. Um, we are grateful to Jen Berger, our local artist, educator, and event producer for originating tonight's program and making initial contact with Donna. Uh, as some of you may know, we had a great program last night led by Jen um, about sort of poster making and art and activism. And Jen gathered emails to, to continue that, to, to start a group, Burlington base of folks who want to continue that work. Um, so she wanted to extend that opportunity to the audience here tonight. So what we will try to do is have a sign-up sheet up front. If you want to put your email down to be involved in a Burlington-based arts <coughs> activism group led by Jen, then we can get your contact information and capture that. Um, we want to thank the Women's Center for co-sponsoring Donna's visit, um, the Hive Collective in Burlington South End for hosting the poster making workshop last night, um, and uh, um, Sarah has a bunch of other people <laughs> to thank tonight. We want to acknowledge a lot of UVM community and, uh, and community members who helped to fund this uh, event tonight, and that includes the Molly Ruprecht Fund uh, through the Art Department, so we're incredibly grateful for their donation. Uh, we're incredibly grateful to the Fleming for this space for us to gather, uh, as well as to uh, our Athletics Department, the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Department, uh, the Theater Department, the Peace and Justice Center, and uh, community member Robin Lloyd for helping to support uh, this important two-day event um, with Afro Ben. Uh, personally, as a local theater performer, uh, I feel uh, all the goosebumps uh, getting to be in a space with a Gorilla Girl, and a Gorilla Girl who's chosen Afro Ben as um, the moniker that she will move through the world with. For those who don't know, and you should know who Afro Ben was. Um, in particular, a, a, a playwright from the 17th century whose work was instrumental uh, in, in moving gender parity forward, which continues to be a struggle, um, and one of the first women playwrights to make her living with her art. Uh, so uh, I think it's, for me, a great honor to have uh, Afro Ben here with us tonight. And without further ado, please join us in welcoming Donna Kaz. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Afra Ben. I was born in 1640, and I think I look pretty good. And I have some news, okay? If you thought you were coming to a lecture, you're not. This is not a lecture. This is not a talk. 
It's a party, and you are all on the VIP guest list. And what would a party be without food, right? So I have a question for you. Who wants a banana? Come on. Like me? Okay, I'm going to try. Back there. I'll try not to hit any part. There you go. Okay, come on, we've got more. We have more, okay, I'll try. party favors later there's gonna be a drawing of girl girl posters can't wait for that uh, okay so Afro Ben is not my real name of course it's my gorilla girl name each member of the gorilla girls takes the name of a dead woman artist and when we appear in public we usually wear gorilla masks to conceal our true identities we do this to focus on the issues of sexism and discrimination instead of on ourselves so that way, no one can accuse us of doing this just to promote our own careers in arts, right? So I stand before you tonight unmasked because I'm here to promote my own career in the arts. <laughs> and I start every one of my parties with a disclaimer. I'm gonna talk about the F word a lot tonight, feminism. And I just want you to know that when I refer to feminism, please know I'm talking about intersectional feminism. Yeah, right. Feminism, yeah. Cool. Feminism is not limited to white, middle class, cisgendered, and able-bodied people. There is no one-size-fits-all feminism. Women experience oppression in different degrees and ways depending on race, class, ethnicity, and gender. So if you hear me say feminism, please know I'm talking about being an advocate for all who identify as women and not just those who have experienced the same barriers that I have. Secondly, I am going to talk a lot about my exploits as a Gorilla Girl, but please know that we were not perfect and we made mistakes. And I think it's important for uh, me to share those mistakes with you to grow and learn from them, okay? Um, so seriously, I decided to unmask because I wore the mask for 21 years and I started to feel, gee, this is like pathetic that I have to wear a rubber Gorilla mask and go around as Afra Ben in order to get anyone to pay attention to sexism and discrimination. I mean, sexism and discrimination are everywhere. If I, I'll give you an example. If February is, uh, is Black History Month and March is Women's History, History Month, what happens the rest of the year? It starts with a duh and ends with discrimination, right? Discrimination. So. I decided to unmask to share my story as a guerrilla girl and share some of the tactics of the girls with others so that perhaps these tactics could live on and you could go out and form your own groups. And that's what, what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, so for the next 40 minutes or so, I declare this a sexist free zone where everyone is a feminist. Everyone believes in equality. And um, I'm happy to say that it is a great time to be a feminist, right? Yeah. I mean, feminism is experiencing a renaissance like we've never seen. It is a swift wind that is sweeping the country, feminism. And it's great to be the wind, right? Because the wind has power, right? The wind is unpredictable. The wind has the ability to mess things up. <laughs> So I'm going to share with you some of the ways that I, as a gorilla girl, went around and messed things up. Now, my book, Unmasked, which talks about, uh, half of it is about my life as, as a member of the Gorilla Girls. Um, and here they are. Here are some of the Gorilla Girls and their pseudonyms. This was at our 25th anniversary. And um, it came out on November 1st, 2016. November 1st, 2016 was a very different time in this country. It was, wow, I was like, hey, my book is coming out. It's going to be the year of the female narrative. Finally, we're going to have a female president and everything's going to be great. So I went on a book tour for eight, for eight days and then November 8th happened. And I'll never forget it. On November 10th, I gave a book, uh, I gave a talk at Blue Stockings Bookstore in New York City, which is like the big feminist bookstore and everyone was crying and depressed and angry 
And all they wanted to say is, all they wanted to talk about was, what do I do? What do we do about Trump? What do we do about Trump? What do we do? So I felt that another more detailed book was needed. And so that really informed me writing this book, uh, Push Pushback, Nine Steps to Make a Difference with Activism and Art. I want to say that tonight, all of us here, let's identify as activists, OK? We're all pissed off about something and want to change something, right? Let's all identify as artists. We are all creative in some way, and we can make a change with our creativity. And so I'm just going to get you all in the mood of thinking of yourselves as activist artists a little bit by asking you these questions and just answer them to yourself. How many of you have ever signed a petition, uh, written a letter to the editor of a newspaper? boycotted or girlcotted, like I like to call it, a product, <laughs> a product because, uh, a product or a business because of how they conducted themselves. How many of you have unfriended someone on Facebook because of their a statement that they made or a policy, right? How many of you have participated in a protest or a march? How many of you have experienced discrimination because of your gender, race, class, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation or age? And how many of you have felt guilty because of your gender, race, class, ethnicity, religion, age, or sexual orientation? So now as you think about the answers to these questions, it's raising, maybe it's raising some memory in you. Maybe you're thinking about something that you haven't thought about in a, a long time, or maybe you're thinking about something that you always think about. So hopefully tonight, um, we're going to all leave here identifying as, as activist artists and have some tools to help us fight against the things that we're pissed off about. Now, I became a Guerrilla Girl in 1997. In 1997, the girls had been working since 1985, and they were experiencing a little bit of burnout. Uh, girls were exhausted from doing all the work, people were leaving, they needed some new life. So they decided to ask women into the group who were not only visual artists, but who were other artists, artists like theater artists. And there were a bunch of us who came into the group who were theater. I studied theater, I was a theater artist, I didn't really know that much about the visual art world. So I came to my first meeting and I said, look, I don't really know a lot about visual arts. What I do know is theater, and this is what, I have an idea for something that we can do as Guerrilla Girls. So I took the famous saying that you find in every single uh, playbill or program that you find at the theater, and I changed it into this. In this theater, the taking of photographs, the use of recording devices, and the production of plays by women is strictly prohibited. The management. During the current season, this theater will produce no plays by women, a public service message from Guerrilla Girls. And so we decided that, you know, at that time in New York City, there were a whole bunch of theaters that were producing season after season of plays by all white men, just written by white men. So I'm going to just read for you from the book of what we did. We decided to turn this into a sticker. We printed in this theater onto Avery labels, six to a page, and distributed it to the Guerrilla Girls interested in our new theater focus. In 1997, the Roundabout Theater, Primary Stages, Signature Theater, The New Group, the Atlantic Theater Company and George Street Playhouse are just some of the theaters producing main stage seasons of plays written entirely by white men. If the show is at 8, I arrive at 7.30 so I can go to the women's room. Once inside a toilet stall, I slip my hand into my purse, slide out a sticker, and quietly rip the backing off so no one can hear me. As I hold the virgin sticker in my palm, I kick the flush bar and slap the sticker hard onto the wall of the stall at the same time. Take that, you sexist theater, you. <laughs> with a huge grin on my face, I make eye contact with the woman online about to enter the stall I am vacating. You are in for a treat. During intermission, I visit a different stall and put up another sticker. After the show, I make one last trip to install a final sticker. All of this happens while my sympathetic baboon boy escorts stickers to the men's room in much the same way. We call men who assist Guerrilla Girl actions baboon boys. And while, yeah, they love it. And while they help us carry out our mission, they are not considered official members of the group. 
At least three stalls in both restrooms will be plastered with the Gorilla Girl public service message by the end of the show. The girls obtain tickets to plays produced by these theater companies either by purchasing them with our own money or with funds from the Gorilla Girls. The most subversive way we sticker is when we volunteer to usher in exchange for a free ticket. As ushers, we openly distribute programs, help patrons find their seats, and secretly apply public service messages to the insides of toilet stalls. <laughs> As I participate in this first Gorilla Girl Theater action, I feel destructive, righteous, and omnipotent. A tremor goes through my core every time I slip a lock closed on the toilet stall and secretly smack another sticker into place. Each sticker is a monologue to a captive audience. Hey, theater goer! Did you know you are supporting a company that produces no plays by women? They won't get away with it forever, not while the Gorilla Girls are around. As each theater mounts a new production in their all-white male season, I return to the same bathroom stalls to continue the campaign. I have to suppress the urge to scream out an ebullient cry of victory when I see the remains of the sticker I had put up four, four weeks ago not completely scratched off. Hint. Avery labels are really hard to remove. <laughs> so we were off and running. And I just say about that, um, that we are addressing, we decided to address the audience. A lot of people didn't know. What? I'm going to a theater that doesn't produce any women? I never even thought about it. So we stickered, we stickered these theaters. We heavily stickered the, the roundabout especially. Uh, because I just hate the roundabout. They, they, they still, they still try to, you know, they still try to do seasons of all plays by men. But anyway, guess what happened? They announced their next season and include two plays by women. Their next, yeah. They had not produced a seat, the play by a woman in 12 years. I know, shocking, 12 years. So we took complete credit for that, of course, <laughs> right? We changed. Then we thought, wow, we're, all, we, we're done. <laughs> we changed the theater world. They all know they're sexist. They're going to change the way so we can take our gorilla masks off and go home. But of course, what happened the next season? They went back to all, you know, we didn't stick her, and they went back to all, a season of all plays by white men. I just want to say here that our work is not about the work of, of white men going away. Our work is about equality. There has to be a place at the table for everyone. We, we don't advocate getting rid of, of me, uh, work by men. We advocate for equality uh, because if they were just, that, that's not equality either. So I always like to say that. Um, but we were really excited with this first Gorilla Girl action um, because um, you know we got a little bit of, of, a, uh, of a response to it, and that was really exciting. So we kept going the theater committee. Now we were made up of like three, four, five women who would meet as a subcommittee before the official Gorilla Girls meeting. And we would meet every 28 days. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and we got a lot of work done because one, we were a small group of women. We were three, four, and five women, six women, seven women, and we were able to do some collaborative work. Um, we were theater artists, so we were used to collaborating. We were used to throwing everything into the mix and giving everyone sort of a chance to say something and make collaborative art. And we would come up with these ideas and then we would present them to the Gorilla Girls. And, and we would make sure they were pretty polished because what happened at a Gorilla Girl meeting is that people voted thumbs up or thumbs down about things that we would do. So that's how we started to work the theater committee. We called ourselves the Gorilla Girls Theater Committee. And this brings me to step one of how to make a difference with activism and art. Huddle up. Make groups of three, four, and five people. Make small groups so you can get a lot done. An idea develops slowly if it's kept inside one mind. An idea develops slowly if it's kept inside one mind. You have to share your ideas to spark them and let them grow. And being a part of a huddle, a collaborative group, is a way to do this. So form small groups um, and you can get a lot of work done. Step number two is collect evidence. Now at this time, this was way before you know, the World Wide Web and things like that. 
But the Guerrilla Girls did something we call the five minute research technique, which is just to count, go in galleries, count how many paintings are by men, how many by women. We would take out the New York Times and we would count the theater listings. This is how we found out how many plays are being produced by women, how many by men, how many plays are directed by women, how many by men. You know, how many artists of color are they hiring? Um, and if we didn't know if someone's name, we didn't know, we would call up and we would ask. So you have to gather the evidence. You have to have the evidence behind your issue. Know the facts. Facts are your weapons. The truth needs to come out there. So know the evidence and collect, uh, collect it for your particular activist art. And step number three is think like an expert because you are one. A lot of times people go, I don't know anything about this issue. I can't do anything about it because I'm not an expert. I'm going to leave it up to the experts. But you are the expert because you have experience. You have a personal story connected to your issue. People don't want to hear, you know, racism is terrible. It must go away. They want to hear your story that's connected to experiencing discrimination or sexism. And we all have it, right? And I think that if we all think of ourselves as, as experts, we would speak out more and we would make more art. This world is affecting all of us. All of these things happening right now is affecting all of us. So we are the experts about that. So use your passion and your story to fight what you believe in. I'm just going to now go through some of the other uh, projects that the Guerrilla Girls Theater Committee did. There's a tragedy on Broadway and it isn't Electra. <laughs> Only 8% of the plays and less than 1% of the musicals on Broadway were written by women. Guerrilla Girls think that's even sadder than a Greek tragedy. There's only one explanation for what's currently playing discrimination. And you can see at the bottom there, we have the stats, um, uh, where we got them here, and public service message from Guerrilla Girls and a way to contact us, because you always want a way for people to get in touch with you to send you hate mail. Or, <laughs> <laughs> so we got a, or love letters, sometimes you get that, you know. Um, so um, that was something that we did about Broadway because we started to look at, and this is true in the arts, the more money there is, Broadway is a place where as a theater artist you can actually make a living. The more money there is, the bigger the museum, the bigger the Broadway theater, the, the, that's where you won't find a lot of women or artists of color working. And so we wanted to show that women uh, should be, we need more broads on Broadway. And th this stat is really horrible, 1%, less than 1%. No, that's bad. Um, we also tried to find new ways into issues to make them humorous or more fun. So we took you know, the fact that it's really hard to be a, a woman playwright, and we made this poster. Oh, the joys of being a woman playwright. You're in control. You produce your own plays, because if you don't, they won't get produced. <laughs> You're special. During Black History Month or Women's History Month, your work receives at least one staged reading. You're hot. If you're under the uh, age of 30, your career might last a few seasons. You save money. You don't have to buy evening gowns for all those award ceremonies. You live in the moment. No need to obsess about your place in theater history. You won't have one. You don't fear failure. Your breasts are the only things that'll flop. 81% of all the plays produced in the U.S. during the 1998-99 season were written by white men, a public service message from Guerrilla Girls Conscience of the Theater World, which we started to call ourselves at that time. Um, so that's just a, another um, uh, poster that we made trying to celebrate the fact that we were being discriminated against. And it you know, made people think about it uh, a little bit more. Um, so. Well, we also branched out. We not only did stuff about um, theater or the arts, we also did things like this. I love feminism more than ever. Then women are less than men. Now women are less than men. <laughs> then Equal Rights Amendment, not part of the US Constitution. Now Equal Rights Amendment, not part of the US Constitution. Then less than 50% of all US senators and representatives are women. Now less than 50% of all US senators are, and representatives are women. So this was made about 12 years ago, and the new stat is less than 22% of all U.S. senators and representatives are women. That's a 7% increase, and if it doesn't sound like a lot, it's because it's not. 
But all of that is gonna change in seven days. <laughs> now, I just have to say, I think it's so fabulous that you live in a state where you can register to vote right up to the voting day. That is really great. Uh, that is something to be really proud of. Um, so I was talking about reactions before and letters. Here's a letter we got. Dear Guerrilla Girls on Tour, I am a white male who attended your presentation at John Carroll University as a requirement for my philosophy class. <laughs> I agree that women should not be treated unfairly, but I believe the way that you presented your argument was not only rude, but irresponsible. <laughs> Even though you supported your argument with facts and statistics, <laughs> I believe that your attacks on political figureheads such as George W. Bush and Arnold Schwarzenegger were not only unconnected to your argument, but also ridiculous. Both of these men are not directly related to the inequalities of women, Lance Z. Dear Lance, yes they are. <laughs> He didn't write back. <laughs> Which brings me to step number four, use humor. <laughs> Wherever you can, use humor. Humor is a weapon. And if you make people laugh, you can get them to listen to your message. And so if you make people laugh, you can make them think, and maybe you might be able to change a few minds. So when you can, not every issue is funny, but when you can, use humor. Steal from popular culture. Step number five, I call queer it up. Yeah, yeah queer it up. Don't forget to queer up your huddle. Okay, so by that I mean in the sense that the word is about moving outside of narrowness. It's a word that gives space to explore and include many different groups. So your huddle should not look like you, like it's just made up of all of people like you. You need to diversify. This means you need to start having hard conversations. We need to start having those hard conversations, okay? Don't fall into any old patterns or ways of working that reinforce the rigid definitions of male and female. Resist cis heterosexism. Yeah, I like this word queer because it explores gender and se sexuality. So if your group is made up of people with similar backgrounds and experiences, you have to find a way to break it up. Uh, it makes sure you have to have multiple points of view. Um, and that means don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think that a lot of times we're like, gosh, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, so I'm really not gonna reach out or, and march with Black Lives Matter, even though I should. We all should be marching with Black Lives Matter, you know? So we have to have these uncomfortable conversations, and I think now is the time. We're turning to each other and talking to each other because horrible things are happening in the world. So make sure that you queer up your huddle. Don't buy into the line, if it's not my personal experience, it's not my politics. Okay? We have to step outside of that. Step number six. This is urgent. All of your activist art has to have a sense of urgency. This must change now. Not tomorrow. Not in a year. We don't have 30 days for climate change. You know, things like that. I think climate change movement is the one movement that is now getting a lot of press about this has to happen now because we ignored it for so long. So you have to find a way to get some sense of urgency in your message, okay? You capture attention, uh, you explain. You have to explain why time is of the essence and this has to happen now. Um, here's somebody who's giving me a sense of urgency. <laughs> saying, if you don't take off that mask, you're gonna be arrested. This is actually from a Tony protest. We did a protest of the Tony Awards in 1999 and 2000, and um, we wanted to use the Tony Awards to show that women don't win Tony Awards because women don't work on Broadway. 
So the first thing that we did is we went to the TKS, uh, TKTS booth in New York City where everyone buys half price tickets to Broadway shows and we tried to give out stickers. You know, we gave out our stickers. Um, we wanted to put them in bathroom toilet stalls. Um, we said, we gave them a sticker with a little note that said, today we're asking you to help us change American theater by going to the toilet. When you go to the theater, put up the sticker in the bathroom and help us flush out discrimination in New York theaters. And we gave them our, our um, uh, uh, you know, there's a tragedy on Broadway and it is an Electra and oh, the joys of being a woman playwright. And unfortunately, everyone thought we were cast members from The Lion King. <laughs> That's actually true. Nobody wanted a sticker. They wanted a free ticket to The Lion King and an autograph. Um, so that didn't work. So that's, we had to go back to the drawing board for that. So we decided, hey, let's do a huge protest. Let's invite everyone we know and let's do a huge protest of the Tony Awards. Now, wearing those big rubber gorilla masks was really hard because you couldn't shout during a march. It really, you know, stifled your voice. Um, so we decided to partner with another, another activist group called the Art Cheerleaders. Uh, and they became our voices. They are Boston art school students dedicated to heightening the connection between the arts and community <laughs> interests through cheerleading. And they were great because they, you know, they did the normal hey, hey, ho, ho, sexism on Broadway's got to go, but then they also invented their own cheers, like the Tony is baloney because the system doesn't place value on the work of women. That is a disgrace. <laughs> I mean, they, they just had a, they had a whole bunch of cheers and they were really loud and they were really awesome. And we also decided to invite the public. So we, in they, those days, we did it through an email blast. We just email blasted everyone we knew. We said, show up on the steps of St. Patrick's Cathedral at this time and we'll march and we'll protest the Tony Awards. And we made these paper bags so that the public could be Gorilla Girls for a day. So they had the gorilla mask on the front, and they had I'm a gorilla girl on the back. Uh, now at this time, what we, what we were protesting is that it was the 52nd annual Tony Awards, and no woman had ever won for directing. So, um, you know, that's a hard stat. That's an awful stat. So we marched down. We, we, put, we got these beautiful black capes, which had, there's a tragedy on Broadway, there's an Electra on the back, so we would blend in with everyone else in their evening gowns. <laughs> and we were very loud, the police came by, they barricaded us in, we chanted, we chanted. The um, producer of the Tonys came flying out of Radio City Music Hall, wanted to know what we were doing, and we, we tried to tell him what we were protesting, and he got so mad. He said, this is, we're not discriminatory, and he ran back in. Um, the only person who actually paid attention to us was Alec Baldwin, who pulled up in his limo, got out of his car, came over to us, took all our materials, and said he would look into it for us. We're still waiting to hear back from Alec Baldwin about that. Um, but that was the only person who was interested. And then after an hour and a half, the news was really mad because we were really loud and they couldn't do any of their reporting live from outside. So the police came and said, if you don't take off your masks, you know, we, we will arrest you. There's a law that actually dates back to the Ku Klux Klan. You cannot protest wearing a mask. So we didn't want anyone to find out that Meryl Streep was a member of our, oh. Uh, so we, we took off our masks, we went home, then we took off our masks, and uh, unfortunately no, no women won Tony's. But since that time, I am proud to announce that nine women have since won a Tony for directing, um, which is eight more than have won an Oscar for directing. Yeah, so there are still really bad stats out there. Um, so that was our Tony protest, which was written about in Mother Jones magazine. We had a reporter follow us. It was, it was very exciting. And it brings me to my next step, step number, um, step number seven, which is learn how to play defense. Uh, this is all about a power struggle, right? A lot of times you feel like you are on the defensive team, especially these days. And we are on the defensive team. But, you know, as some great football coach said, 
The team that wins is the team that has the best defense. And we just have to admit that we are on this defensive team and learn how to play it well. Um, now, I talked about that half of my book was about the Gorilla Girls. The other half is about my experiences. I went, as I, as I went to write this book, I thought about how did I become a feminist? What, what was my first inkling to actually become a feminist? And it was actually in college. Um, I, I went to, um, I was, I had a lot of questions about my body and what was happening to my body, and so I found a book called My Body, Our Bodies Ourselves. And I read it, and it had a lot of information for me, and I, I experienced feminism for the first time, and I started to identify as a feminist. Well, I graduated college, I identified as a feminist, I was gonna to go to New York City, and I was going to make feminist theater, and within six weeks of moving to Manhattan, I met a man named William Hurt, who was a rising star, and we ended up getting involved with each other, and I, ha I had a three plus year relationship with him that was full of domestic violence. So half of my book is about surviving sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, I want to honor everyone in here in the room who is a survivor of any kind of violence. Um, it took me 14 years just to identify as a survivor of domestic violence. I used to say to myself, it wasn't so bad. He only hit me, I only ended up in the emergency room once, you know, things like that to just deny. There's a lot of shame involved. And it took me 35 years to actually write about it. And I write about it, I also want to acknowledge that, um, you know, it was the right time for me to tell my story, but you don't have to tell your story. You control your story. If you want to tell it, tell it. If you don't want to tell it, it's fine. We have lived too many years in a culture broken by brutally powerful men. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dare speak the truth to the power of those men. Their time is up, their time is up, their time is up. It's Oprah Winfrey. So the past couple of weeks have been very tough, right? Survivors of violence. Um, I think that it's my mission as a feminist to find uh, uh, strength. And I want to say that even though we went through horrible, horrible times the past three weeks, and even, you know, I'm going to talk about yesterday and the day before too, no one is ever going to forget Dr. Ford. No one will ever forget her, right? No one. Um, you know, these these are, the, these, are the, these are the powerful things and the powerful, powerful things that are happening and the positive things that are happening. No one's going to forget her. Women are believed. Women are being believed. We are not alone. This is the other thing. We are not alone. This is another comfort and a good thing that's happening. We are not crazy, right? And um, people will never forget her. So she is ingrained in our memory. Um, you know, things are happening. Uh, you know, there are Jewish organizations that are still doing the work of helping refugees. Um, Muslim community is helping the Tree of Life uh, survivors and that community. There are positive things happening in this world that we need to just take a moment and acknowledge, especially in these times of despair when it's really, really hard. Which brings me to step number eight, which is celebrate the wins. Celebrate the wins. They might be small and they might not come a lot, but we have to celebrate them when we can. I'm happy to report that since the Gorilla Girls began fighting sexism in theater in 1997, a lot of other groups have sprung up to address the same issues, like the Kilroys and 5050 in 2020 and Little Black Dress Inc and the LA Female Playwrights Initiative. Now there are a lot of people addressing this issue. And theaters no longer get away with season of plays all by white men, except the roundabout. <laughs> um, they will, you know, now what happens is, and it's, this is sort of another problem that we have to figure out how to address, they'll put one slot for either a writer of color or a, a play by a woman, and then they'll say, I'm not discriminatory, here's my one slot. 
Or, you know, they'll do, here, we're gonna stage it, we're gonna do a, a celebration of female playwrights. Uh, we're gonna do a stage reading series of 10 plays by women every other leap year, um, you know, at the uh, Rikers Island Hospital. You know. And therefore, we are not discriminatory, you know. So we have to call organizations to task on that. Um, I feel very lucky to have been a, a guerrilla girl and to be a guerrilla girl. Um, here are some of my wins. I got to meet Gloria Steinem. And I got to, uh, Yoko Ono gave us her Courage Award for the Arts in 2010 and we got to meet her. Um, I've got to travel all over the world. I got to take a, a cooking class with a, with a chef in China. I got to perform kabuki with the only all-female kabuki troupe in Japan. That's me on the left in a, in a costume that weighed about 65 pounds. Um, I also got to attend Obama's inauguration. It was so much fun. And I even had beer. Oh, and I got to um, propose a bill on the, on the Senate floor. And I even had beer with the Pope, the old Pope. Actually, I stretched the truth in a few of those. I, I didn't really have beer with the Pope. I had vodka shots with the Pope. <laughs> now, make no mistake, I don't spend all of my time photoshopping myself into history. Sometimes I use Final Cut Pro. <laughs> I want to thank the Fleming Art Museum and the Women's Center for inviting me. And, and you know, this audience has a lot of friends in it I have, I, that I met last night. Everyone who came to the um, workshop. Jen, thank you so much for making this connection. Um, to everyone here has been really awesome. So I'm going to uh, wrap up a little bit and I'm going to do a Q&A at the end, but I know that I haven't gotten to the ninth step yet. If you've been counting, <laughs> it's coming. I just want to encourage you to support women artists and artists of color. If you see a play by a woman or an exhibit, uh, buy tickets, go, support. Um, I just read, I was trying to find women's theater here in um, Burlington. Um, there's a women's festival of crafts later on November. And of course, everyone in six days or seven, like a week from today is going to vote, right? So this lecture is an ebook. It's not an ebook yet. It's going to be an ebook in January. If you go to gorillagirlsontour.com, sign up. You can get this ebook for two bucks when it comes out, okay? Um, and now, before I do the ninth step, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. The free giveaway of posters, right? Someone's gonna win. Okay, let's do this fairly. I'm gonna reach down. I'm not looking. I didn't read any of these names. Let's pick one. And it is Greta Alexandra Parker. Where are you, Greta Alexandra? Yay! Now, I'm not gonna fling this up there. You can come down and get your posters. Yay, Greta. <laughs> You're welcome. Congratulations. Sure. Let's hear from Greta. Okay, here we go. Step, I'm just gonna review the steps and then get to the ninth step, okay? One, huddle up. Two, collect the evidence. Three, think like an expert because you are one. Four, use humor. Five, queer it up. Six, this is urgent. Seven, learn how to play defense. Eight, celebrate the wins. And the last step, nine, we got this. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Shit hits the fan. Life sucks. Every day brings fresh oppression. Forces with tremendous power and prestige outpace you until you feel as if you will never win. And if that weren't enough, you are hit in the face with a bucket of ice-cold truth. 
You are not the right age, sex, weight, color, or class. You will never win, nor will you ever fit in anywhere. You have missed every single opportunity that knocked, and your head swells with a pressure you are sure will make it pop off once you stop banging it against the wall. Still, wrongs do not cease from rising up around you. Every day you are a witness to people being held down for daring to expose who they are, black, female, trans, disabled, Muslim, survivor, lesbian, poor. Some of these people are killed. The world feels as if it might blow up any second. So you put your head down and you hide. You believe there are others more capable to fight the many battles around the globe. You retreat into the jungle. News of defeats and losses, of abuse, injustices, reach you inside your safe zone. You beat your chest and let out a roar of support, hoping it is heard by the brave few on the front lines. Months go by and nothing changes. You write a letter of support to the defenders of equality and human rights. Again, you see no change. You lose all hope and believe the end is near. You retreat further into the jungle. And then one day, you wake up angry. It is not like you have never woken up angry before, but this time, it's different. This time, the anger is in your stomach and in your heart. It is in your neck. You can feel it in your knees and behind your eyeballs. The anger is not outside anymore. The anger is you. You are anger. And anger does not give in. Anger does not like hiding in the jungle. Anger comes out of you in words on a page and sharp lines on a paper. It is the music of your voice and the sound of your feet marching in movement. When you close your eyes, your anger takes you directly to a harmonious world where you fit in. The energy you feel when you are angry is so strong it might possibly change the world. So you start the long walk out of the jungle and into the fight. You take your angry body and you push up against the forces of a peace, against the foes of a peaceful world with incredible fortitude and everlasting endurance. You will not give up until you win. These are the stages of activist art that I have experienced. Being overwhelmed, retreating into the jungle, sending the frontline support, realizing you must contribute in a more present way, using one's rage to create activist art, finding the power of the push. Let's face it, the world's gone bananas. But in the darkest moments of despair, you can always count on the deepest part of yourself, the part from which ideas come to be there. Maybe it has not been accessed in a long time, and maybe it needs a little waking up. But it is this creative self that is both powerful and brave. We are all artists inside because we all have the ability to imagine. So do not despair. We got this. We can do this together. Now go out there and mess things up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pe Penelope and I, I didn't introduce Penelope, my sister, <laughs> who travels with me. But um, I will take questions. Uh, anyone has any questions, please um, feel free to ask. Oh, great. We can't talk at the same time. No, that's right. I'll t I have to turn this off then. Work it out. I don't know. Yeah, my voice. Oh, there it is. My voice is loud, so I'll just. Simultaneous? Yes, yeah, it's so okay. I can shout. I'll turn this yeah. off after you ask the yeah. question, and then. After we'll answer on mic. We'll start over here. Hi. Thank Hi. you very thank much you. Um, for coming to Vermont. Um, I was lucky enough last year at exactly this time um, to be in New York and to see your work at the Whitney's um, Art of Activism show. Mm -hmm. um, I was with my 10 year old son. We walked around that show. There were tears. I had to comfort him and explain a lot of things, but I thought it was really important that you see it. Um, when we stood in front of the Gorilla Girl's work, it's something he had never 
heard of before, the violence against, I mean, the work was yeah. particular against violence against women. But it, it, it started, you know, an obviously an incredible dialogue. And I'm wondering if the, the e-book and the, maybe the curriculum that, you know, can you, you yeah. know, is that stuff included? Um, because I think it's so important to have that catalyst, yeah. to have that conversation, yeah. because that is a tough one to talk to, you know, elementary and middle school aged kids. You mean how to actually implement, how to make activist art for as a curriculum? No, how to, I mean, basically how to, for my son it was more about the conversation that that yeah. existed in the yeah. world. And, right. you know, it's something where you can't, you know, humor absolutely is, is so valuable for yeah. getting the message across, but in that case it was, it was really just reading the facts for him. Yeah. That he, he just couldn't believe that it existed, but he was able to see it, and then we talked yeah. about it. And well, it you know, I think that's good. I think talking is good. I think kids need to be talked to about all of these issues. And you can figure out a way and you can figure out the time to do it. Um, and, and younger and younger and younger. It's not, I don't think it's too young because, you know, they're living in this world and they have access to television and the internet and everything. So it's important to talk to them, especially about violence. I guess you know, the ebook is a much more detailed explanation of uh, every single chapter has okay. five sub chapters cool. about it. Um, yeah. Okay, great. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, I don't remember which number it was, you talked about we are on the defense right. versus being on the offense. Right. Um, right. It seems to me right. that in this world right now, we need to be on the offense, yeah. um, not on the defense. Yeah, well, you know, you know, maybe I should use this so we don't have to yeah. go back and forth. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, we would, I would, we would like to be on the offense, but we're not. So my, my point in saying we're on the defense is like, accept, accept the fact that we're on the defensive team, and the defensive team, we can, we can use it to our advantage and, and use tactics. Uh, for example, um, you know, it's very easy to, like I said, it was very easy to be depressed over, you know, what happened with the Kavanaugh hearings. Uh, but we have to come to some kind of grips with that happens over and let's take what we can from it and move on and be positive about it. I mean, playing defense is, you know, it, technically it's, it's creating strategies um, to, um, to allow yourself to have wins and celebrate the wins. Um, but I think that if we, if we don't accept the fact that we are on the defense right now, I, I think we, we're going to be coming from a wrong place. Um, so trying to figure that out um, is important. Um, and like I said, you know, there is always a defense and offense. But I don't think we can ever say, you know, it's a patriarchal society, so women are feeling, you know, have been feeling this for a while. I also think with Trump, we are on the on the defense. Although, I'm really surprised, you know, I, I, we're, it's going to tell a lot. Um, I always wonder when uh, the media is talking about the base, Trump's base, playing to his base, who, who is this base? <laughs> and where is the base? And how big is the base? And, and we'll see. I don't know. It, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like, and we're going to see on election day what, what it, exactly what it looks like. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thank you again. That was amazing. Um, I'm curious, the, some of the photos you showed and some of the history. And so I've been familiar with the Cabrillo Girls for a long time. Yeah. And since that time, I've also been exposed to lots of um, arts activists, theater activists, protest groups. And I'm really curious, what was it about the Cabrillo Girls? What was about the thinking that rose you to the level of impact and also hit, like, that we're still talking about the Cabrillo Girls 20 something years later. So, what, what was the thinking that got you and made you so impactful in history? Mm -hmm. um, so, the tactic of wearing gorilla masks and taking the names and no one knowing who we were was, a, I think, was very powerful. Um, and that was able to get our message across and make us interesting. So, that the press wanted to look at us and people started to want to collect the posters and things like that. Um, so, that was one way that we were very effective. Um, and especially with just the stickering, the roundabout, we actually heard
from someone that in an internal meeting they talked about stickers. And I think it is a reason why they changed their ways for their next season. Um, so that was, that was really good. But after a while, when, when we started to do theater, also the press would call us and say, God, gosh, we didn't know the Gorilla Girls were still, still around. You know, you, you strike while the iron is hot, and for a while we were really impactful and sort of notorious. And then you have to figure out ways to keep that momentum going, which is the hardest thing. Um, so breaking it from visual arts into theater was a great way to also get us in front of the news again. Um, that's always, always the problem. But the masks were effective in that way. Um, they were also ineffective in that they were a barrier. So you couldn't see people's faces or, or expressions and it sort of became, you know, in theater, mask work is very difficult. Um, so the theater girls actually, as you saw in the pictures, we, we, our masks started to get cut smaller and smaller and smaller so that our mouths would be exposed. Um, and having this face-to-face -face conversation is a lot different than if I had something covering my entire face. So it works both ways. I think whatever tactic, tactic we find that works, um, you know, go with it. But, you know, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Another hand. There we go. And people up in the balcony. We'll get to you. Um, this is a light question, but... Did you know that Pope you were having a beer with declared radical feminism an official heresy? Yeah, I know that's why we were talking about that. Excellent. Um, all right, we're gonna hand the mic up. I don't know if I need to go all the way up. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I was so, so excited to, to hear that you were gonna be here and talk about this important work. Um, I really like that you said our work is um, about equality and not getting rid of white men. And I'm struggling to find like words to broaden the conversation, you know, in terms of including men. And there's a lot of stories, and particularly in Burlington, of white men having been abused at our orphanage here, which is horrific. And you know, a lot of victims and survivors are men, so I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on opening that up a bit. Thank you. Yeah, well, you have to talk about people. You know, uh, people are abused. It's not only women who are victims of, of sexual assault. Uh, it's people are victims of sexual assault. So you have to include them in that conversation. I think that, um, you know, every chance you get, you just have to bring up the conversation. Like I was talking about the difficult conversations. That might be a difficult conversation. Um, you know, and also there's this spin around now, reverse sexism, and that men are really, you know, like Trump's saying, it's, it's a horrible time for men. You know, I, I, we just have to talk about that, be honest about that. What do you think, you know? What do you think about that? And um, it's true that it's hard for people to still identify as feminists. I, I was speaking at a high school last week, and. I would ask the kids, you know, how many of you are feminists? And of course, gosh, they're not feminists at all. You know, that's, you know, then I would say, well, how many of you believe in equality? And they all raised their hands. So I said, well, congratulations, you're all feminists. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you have, yeah. I just want to add this great movie, a French film called I'm Not an Easy Man. Uh -huh. And it's a turning of the tables, so they use yeah. the word masculinists yeah. a lot. Yes, the, the poster winner, <laughs> Greta. <laughs> um, so I'm in high school, and um, I've been trying to start a feminist organization at my high school. And like what you were saying, I think like a lot of my friends, like her girls, you know, they're afraid to like identify as a feminist because they want to have a boyfriend, and maybe they want to have a boyfriend. Yeah, right. <laughs> but so I was wondering if you had any advice for my up-and-coming feminist organization. <laughs> well, you could call it the Feminist Boyfriend Club. <laughs> I mean, no, um, you know, especially with that, you, you could probably figure out a way to call it something else, and then when you meet, have conversations about equality and feminism. And that way, you know, we'll say, look, this is, this is the definition. You know, everyone used to ask us, what's your definition of feminism? And I always liked Roxanne Gay, who said, 
you know, feminism has a perfectly fine definition. We don't have to redefine it. And it really just means equality. So, you know, you could call it the equality club or the whatever. Um, figure out a way to just start to have those conversations about feminism because it is hard in high school. People don't want to be labeled as anything, right? You want to fit in. So just start a group and uh, start a huddle. Okay. Yeah. Huddle. Sure. Huddle up. Huddle up. Yeah. There was a question. There were hands up here. I saw hands at some point. More waving of hands. Just kidding. It was all Any more all questions? the time. Um, I am a theater student here, and I'm actually doing my thesis in um, like women in theater and trying to bring like a one act together that kind of brings in a lot of different things with feminism throughout history. Um, but some of the struggles that I've been having, and it, it doesn't, you don't have to have a solution to it, but just um, like this is a very, it's hard to not speak outside of your experience. Mm -hmm. So being a white woman, I don't want, to, like I feel like I can't even examine or look at like stories or, I don't know, plays that involve people that aren't like exactly like me or haven't experienced things that I have. And, but I want to like broaden the horizon beyond that also there are not very many like people of color in this state that I could draw from to have in plays like that. So like, how do you, like I know like in New York you have like so many options and there are lots of people that you can draw on. So like, but when it comes down to like communities that are smaller, how do you broaden that conversation and get bodies on stage and like have discussions about that? I know you were saying like doing like stage readings, those are like really helpful for discussions, but like how do you, take it that next step into producing work like that? Well, you can, you're can. you smart to be educating yourself with as many resources as you can and reading a lot of plays by lots of different people, uh, which is easy to do. Um, I think you need to have a conversation with your department too because I was almost said it tonight, but I didn't. I mean, you're producing three plays by white men. I know. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> And um, you know, say what is the next season going to be? Why don't we do this play? And if they say we don't have any actors, you know, who could fit these roles, say, well, we'll find them. Why can't we find them? You know, it's not impossible. Um, uh, uh, so you need to have those conversations, and you need to infiltrate your department with, you know, if they won't listen to you, then start putting up stickers or start putting up, you know, just start putting up titles of plays that people should be reading or that you really liked or make a, make a, you know, a report card like the Gorilla Girls, you know, the theater department report card, you know, this season, this is how many plays we read, you know, by artists of color or, you know, and keep them to task on it. But it doesn't mean that, you know, it's not like you're appropriating someone's culture just by infusing yourself with as much knowledge as you can. That's the difference. And you need to, you know, we all need to do that. Yeah. Okay, I think, is there one more question? Other questions? Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, you mentioned some of the criticism that the Gorilla Girls get and some of the hatred I know you receive in your work. Yeah. It so makes sense. But um, I was curious, you know, you seem very confident and I was curious if it ever gets to you. Has ever made it hard oh, yeah. to do your work or other Gorilla Girls too? Yeah, it gets to me, but you know, now I'm much older and I don't give a crap anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Because of this whole beating up, you didn't do enough about you know you're you you didn't do enough about this, or you're not doing enough about women in music, and you well, you know and we would say well you can do that, you take up the cause, or we would you know, make mistakes and um, people would not forgive us. So women that need we need to stop beating each other up. Um, and, 
But yes, it was very depressing to not see any change for a long time. So 1997 to, you know, now, just now, we are, we are just experiencing now people who are looking at sexism in theater. So it was very frustrating. Um, but, you know, it's also, you know, fun to use the, um, the uh, letters that we get and, that, you know, that are, that are actually funny. So, <laughs> anyway, you know what, I'm gonna, if anyone has a question, I will stick around and answer them. I also will stick around to sign posters and books, if you like. Um, but again, thank you, you are an amazing audience, and I really um, appreciate the warm welcome, thank you.